grow here. In this video, I wanted to talk about some of the things that I've been seeing going on in physics from various people, professors and uh, YouTube influencers and um, just in general, I've been watching a great debate going on in physics regarding string theory and some other things. And I kind of just wanted to weigh in, you know, give my little two cents on what's been going on. I don't know what's causing, you know, this rift that's going on in physics, but <clears throat> I figured that maybe a little bit of what I have to say might, you know, help give a little guidance or, you know, get people to think in a different mindset. Maybe my mindset, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, physics intuition. You know, I was watching this video on YouTube the other day, and it it, it was talking about um, someone made a point that physics requires a spiritual element, that you can't really do physics and science without being spiritual and uh, you know I thought I, you know I thought that was a little funny the way they, the way they talked about it and the way they said you know that ancient physics and, and, and whether it's alchemy or other things they, there was a lot of spiritualism and mysticism and philosophy mixed in with the science and you know I, I can't totally disagree with that I do you know whether you believe in God or the universe or some higher power, you know, or some power within yourself. I believe that in nature there is a balance. If you look at birds, you know, um, animals, they have some sort of instinct. They don't know physics, they don't know mathematics, you know, not like we do, you know, but they can find their way. You know, a bird doesn't have Google Maps, but it can find its way from. New York down to Miami, Florida, you know, or, you know, down south somewhere without using Google Maps and go to the same place every year. I've seen insects, you know, crawl, jump up, fly up, land on a specific spot, leave for 15 minutes, come back to that same exact spot, jump, fly back down and land on the same spot that they left and keep right on going. And so animals have some sort of intuition within them. And I don't think humans are so far removed from nature that we ourselves can't have an intuition. And what I like to do is, you know, even in um, my physics, I like to, you know, try to tap in to nature or look at, look at physics from a natural point of view, which is how I started with my space-time superposition chart. I was looking for something in nature to explain a debate that I saw. And the debate that I saw is what got me started in creating the space-time superposition chart. So I've moved on to other charts now, but now I'm seeing another debate going on. And I kind of want to weigh in on this because I think that with the methodology that I use of looking for something in nature or trying to tap into an inner intuition that I have and then applying math or reasoning after that intuition is what I want to impress upon maybe the physics community. I think that we relied sometimes too heavily on mathematical equations and, you know, things that we've learned from other people instead of tapping into, you know, the natural, um, you know, I'm having a hard time articulating what I'm trying to say because I think that deep in, down inside, we all know the right and natural way that physics operates because we are part of this. We are our physiology is part of the space-time fabric, is part of nature, is part of this world and this reality that we live in. 
and being part of that, it's not unreasonable to believe that we can know within ourselves the natural way that things operate. Just like a bird knows how to fly south. The key is to tap into that knowledge and understanding. And that's the perspective that I take when I dive into physics. Then once you come up with, once you have an, an intuition, you come up with a theory or you feel that something is wrong or right, then you pursue after that using the mathematics and the, cal and the calculations and the research. But I think that sometimes we look at things and we see, we just know that something's just not right about that. Something's wrong. And I think that we, we looked at string theory for decades and we just, we accepted it because it, you know, it said certain things, but I think deep down inside, we knew that something was still missing. You know, um, I like to say that in everything, there's a balance. Nature has a natural balance. And the key to solving these mysteries is to look for the balance. For example, let me let me explain something like math, for example. Some people say, you know, I don't know, I saw this video where they said that um, that biology is applied chemistry and that chemistry is applied physics and that physics is applied mathematics. You know, I believe that math takes on many forms. That calculus, algebra, those are expressions of math. They are not math in itself. They're just expressions of math. You can find math in anything. You know, a sphere, a bowling ball. You know, the human body, you know, the ratios with the human body. You find math in everything is elegant math, and but you also see a balance. In all the math in all the universe, the natural math that you see, if you look at it, you'll always find there's a balance. And, you know, math, they say, you know, even with my space-time superposition chart, I've been told, you know, you need to study math, which I am doing now. I decided that I'm going to go off into math and, and try to get calculus. And I find calculus very fascinating, and it's something that I do want to learn. And so I've kind of started on my journey, you know, um, I picked up where I left off, which was pre-algebra. That's what I finished. You know, I got an A minus in pre-algebra when I was in college, but that's where my math journey ended. Um, <clears throat> that's as far as I've made it to math. But looking at calculus and some other things, it seems very fascinating and very interesting to me. So I decide I'm going to pursue my journey. I'm going to brush up on some of my my algebra and then take a dive and see if I can make it all the way to calculus. Um, that's something I'm going to do for this year. So what I want to say is that even though the little bit of math I've had, which is pre-algebra and my vortex-based mathematics, which pretty much uh, you know any child can do, is very simple math. Those math are just an expression of something that's greater. My space-time superposition chart, that chart itself is an expression of math. It's three by it's a three by three chart, you know, three rows and three columns. That is just as mathematical as a as a calculus, as a formula in calculus. It's just a different expression. And you can you can take that three by three chart and you can create calculus form formulas from that. You know, I don't have the ability to do that, but there are people out there that do have that ability. Soon I will have that ability. Um, but I just want to say that, you know, math can take on many forms. And, and just because you don't understand calculus or understand certain things doesn't mean that you can't do any type of math at all or that your opinions and the things that you write because there's no math in it or aren't worth anything. And that is absolutely not true. You know, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, math is in the eye of the beholder also. You can find math anywhere. If 
you just look. But only looking for math in a specific form or expression, you just cut yourself short. You know, and that's one of the problems in physics today is that people are narrow minded and they're stuck in these narrow corridors and they can't break free. And that's what this video is about. It's about helping you to expand your horizons, helping you to break free of the constraints and the restraints that are holding you from really achieving your true potential in physics. You know, <clears throat> I try to, uh, I don't want to put all my physics work out there because of things. My physics is not just theory. I'm actually trying to build something. I'm trying to uh, engineer certain things. So I have intellectual property that I have to protect, which is why I have not published my matter superposition chart, which is complete, and my light superposition cube, which is also complete. Um, I have some understanding now. My theory has expanded and I have some understanding about the universe that, gen that the people generally in physics do not have. And I'm not revealing that information at this time because of my intellectual property. There, I is, It is my plan to eventually reveal this information. You know, the universe, creation, God's creation, however you want to look at it, is a beautiful thing. And the more that I find, the more that I discover, the more beautiful it becomes. And I have one thing that I do to make sure that in my intuition, in my expressions of math, the ones that I can make, there is a universal checksum that I use to make sure that I am on the right track. Things that I look for to say, am I on the right track? Is this right or is this wrong? And it, it ties into my intuition because it's something that I believe is built into all of us. And that is a natural checksum. There are two natural checksums that I use. The first is one that I've learned from Marco Roden and his Vortex Based Mathematics, and that's the number nine. You know, anyone who watching this video should know that how important the number nine is in all of mathematics and the, and the geometry of the universe. You know, you can find the number nine in calculations uh, ranging from stars, planets, moons, you know, distances, ratios. You, could, you always find the number nine. You can watch a lot. If you don't understand that or you don't know these things, you can YouTube, you can YouTube it and look up the number nine and nine in physics and nine and that you'll find that there the universe has a natural checksum and it is the number nine. Um, there is another checksum that I use besides the number nine and that is ratios, balanced ratios or what I look for also. That's the second thing I look for. You know, you want a balanced ratio. For example, nine itself is a balanced ratio. Think about it. Three sets of three, that's balance. You know, three, six, and nine are balanced ratios. If you look at three, you have one, two, three, you know, and it's balanced. You have a, a, a primary position, secondary position, and a neutral position. The universe comes in threes. Everything in nature is in threes. We see that. Or you can open your eyes and you'll see that. Three, six, and nine, you'll see it in everywhere in nature. And thus, those are the ratios you look for. You know, um, if you look for the number six, is another balanced ratio. Two, four, six. Three sets of twos. The number nine. Three sets of threes. Those are the balancing, the balance. So when I looked at my superposition chart, I saw a balance. I knew it was right because I saw a balance and I saw the number nine. I saw a superposition in the space column at the bottom. I saw a superposition in the time column at the top. And then I saw a superposition in the space time column in the middle. The chart was balanced. So I knew I was on the right track and they, the number nine was everywhere. Three, six, and nine were everywhere, and I knew the chart was balanced. So those are the things I look for. Some of you people watching this video have abilities that I am striving for, such as being able to do calculus. 
Imagine what I could do with calculus, which I'm planning on doing, but you have those abilities. You can look at the math and you can do amazing things with it. You know, I sometimes get really jealous. I wish I could do math like that. You know, and I'm so envious of the people that are able to do those things. But <clears throat> you seem to be missing the intuition part, which I believe is the primary and most important part because it starts with the intuition. It starts with your gut feeling. You know the answer within. You just need to know it without. And you know the answer in your heart. You just need to get it in your head. So sometimes I do a little um, exercise, I guess you could say, where I little fantasize a little bit. I say, you know what, if I, if I could just have some kind of glorious technology, what would it do? What could I make it do? What would it, what, how would it be? What would it be able to do? And I use my imagination a little bit, and I find out that my imagination seems to take a natural path. And it just, I don't, I'm not, I don't limit myself to what ex currently exists. I limit myself to what can be or what would be great if it could do this. And then I look at those things and I find that that intuition that's within me starts to come out in my imaginations. And I start imagining things and then I say, then as I study my physics and I make these discoveries in physics and I say, I look back and I say, you know what? I actually imagined this when I was doing my little imagination exercise. I had the imagination exercise first, and then the physics showed that those things are possible. Intuition came out, and I followed the intuition, and then the math came after that. The chart, math, however, whatever expression comes after that, because that intuition will take life in you, and it'll op flow through your hands and manifest into some into something practical or some reality. So um, you know people it, and I understand why people say you need math you want to separate the crack pots from the actual physicists. You know there there were a lot of physicists throughout history and I've I've watched I've watched a lot of documentaries on physics. There are a lot of physicists that were not mathematicians. They were people working out their garage. People who just made discoveries and reported the discoveries they made. You know, and people that just, you know, maybe they had other occupations and it was just a hobby. And they discovered something and they contributed something. So anyone can contribute to physics. This is a collaborative effort. You know, I don't know about all the conspiracies about, you know, some people being racist or you know trying to keep others out I, I believe that we all need each other that if we're going to make any kind of progress it has to be a collaborative effort no one person has everything you know i have a piece you have a piece they have a, we all have pieces and i couldn't do what i do without the knowledge from other people like i didn't know fourth dimension was time you know, someone had to show me that. They had to show me Euclidean space. You know, I had I had to learn from those who were before me, who passed their knowledge down, and then I contributed something. And I'm gonna be honest with you that this world we're living in, the status quo and the, the stuff from the past is not sustainable prejudice is not sustainable bigotry you know when you ex exclude certain people and ethnic groups and minority groups that is not sustainable because technology is getting to a point where it requires a level of morality and ethics i'm gonna tell you what it, what i believe my, i believe that the higher powers operate through love that you're gonna reach a level, you're gonna hit a ceiling where you have to make a choice. And I think that's where this tech, this civilization's at now. We have to choose. We can continue to, to ascend with love, 
or we can destroy ourselves. You know, love is the key because the higher technologies operate with love. If you get to a point where everyone in society can just has the knowledge and understanding to do anything to hurt other people, even mass hurt masses of people. We're getting to that place where just the average person can hurt a lot of people with the knowledge that they have. There are people who, and I know there's dangerous people out there, there are people that have a hard heart and that are just evil, like the stuff going on with Israel and Hamas. You know, the things that I've seen, or, you know, that they've showed, you know, you have to be a hard hearted person to do those kind of things to hurt an a, a innocent child like that, you know, to dismember people and, and just, uh, they say the people that were lifeless and monsters, but the response, you know, I see also is, you know, and I love the Jewish people. I don't care what nobody says. I love God's people. They're God's people. God loves them. I love them too. But that don't mean they don't have problems. You know, just like any race, I love I love all races. And in each race, in each ethnic and nationality, you have good people and you have bad people. You have people that are liberal, people that are conservative, people that are hard-hearted and uncaring, and people that are loving. You know, people need to make a choice on what they are going to be. And I think it's the responsibility of scientists and the the scientists and people that are educated, intellectuals, to be an example and to lead, not to have racism and, and all these things that are holding down the other people, or the classes, however you want to look at it, the, the non-elitist, intellectual elitist, whatever, all these things that are holding people back, I like to look at it like you have people that Operating love and people that don't. So there's to me there's two classes: the love class and the hate, hard-hearted class. That's what I'm seeing. And both of them have rich people and poor people in both camps. And both of them have somewhat smart people, you know, in both camps also. But my point is that we're at a a point where we have to choose on what we are going to be. And as leaders, intellectual leaders in the love class, we have to take the lead in showing others on how to be. Those people over there in, in the Middle East that are bombing civilians and all that kind of stuff, they're using technology made by smart people, intellectuals. People that understand that you need love. The higher you go in technology, you need to start caring about your neighbor. You need to start loving your neighbor and start caring about other people because you cannot continue to go down that line without love. I believe the government needs to not just have tolerance, but love for its citizens. You can't do that. You need to have love for people. If you're going to take responsibility over someone, you have to love them. You cannot just tolerate them and accommodate them. That's That was all the centuries before. Advanced technology requires an advanced way of thinking. It requires an advanced mindset. The old ways of thinking, the old ways of dealing with things are not going to work with advanced technology. And we are at the point where we're going to go off. We're shooting off to the stars. We're going to be, do, be able to do things that you couldn't even imagine right now. You know, what, do I, what about our neighbor? What are we going to do about that? You know, one class is better than the other class. Oh, you're, you, you've got, you know, you, your skin is whiter or your skin is blacker or browner or, you know, you're better because of that or your brain is better or, you know, other races are stupid and we're smart. We need to keep other races stupid. I'm not going to get into that. You know, I believe there are people that are purposely doing, using chemicals to keep certain people stupid, like lead. You know, it's not an accident that lead is in everything. I think there are, I think there is a conspiracy to dumb down certain segments of the population. You know, you hurt yourself when you do those things because you need everybody. There's no one race that has everything. 
And you are showing that you are just really ignorant if you believe that. You are not an intellectual if you believe that. You are not a scientist if you believe that. You know, you're an ignorant person. You know, we all need each other. We all need to work together. You know, if you need a, a, a compass or something, look for love. Look, look for the love. Does that person care about their neighbor? Does that person care about other people? That's my litmus test. How do you look at other people? How do you look at yourself? Because if you don't, if you respect yourself, you should respect other people. You know, that doesn't mean people don't make mistakes. You know, nobody's perfect. And people learn and grow. Some people make mistakes and they become better behind us after the mistake that they made. You know, writing people off because of mistakes they've made and having nothing to do with them. You cut, you sell yourself short. You cut yourself off from the potential in that individual. You know, so, you know, getting back to the physics, you know, you just look for intuition, look for math in other forms besides calculus and stuff. Find the beauty of math in anything. And then do your checksums with, you know, with the ratios and the number nine, three, six, and nine. Do your checksums. You have a theory or you want to try, try, use the checksums. If something's missing, if it doesn't balance out, that means something's missing. You know, and regarding this, someone trying to find a theory of everything, there's no such thing as a theory of everything because the universe is infinitely expanding. My chart shows that. It expands infinitely. You will always be trying to unify everything because there's no such thing as that. What, there, what, it, what you can find is a path. That's what you need to be looking for, is a path, and a path that connects things. Maybe one day there will be a path that shows a connection between quantum physics and relativity. Once you find something that links quantum physics and relativity, it still will, not, it still will be incomplete because you're going to find a whole new world with stuff, other stuff missing. There's no such thing as a theory of everything. There's no such thing as that. You might can find an algorithm that can lead you down a path that can, where you can find all kinds of discoveries and infinitely learn and infinitely discover. There's no such thing as a theory of everything because you can't find everything in a few things. Everything means everything. And there are new things being created, so you won't have a theory of everything. There's no such thing as that. What you want is functional practicality. You want to find something that is practical and keep it, if you can't find something that links both of them, keep them separate. There's nothing wrong with that. Work in your fields. And then when you find something that overlaps, you mark that, you say, okay, Here's a clue that we find a link between these two things. Let's mark that. And the more you find these marks, it's going to lead to a path that leads somewhere else. And there you will find the bridge that bridges those things. It might be a whole nother area that actually bridges those two things. But then you find, like I said earlier, you find you're missing some other stuff. There is no such thing as a theory of everything because you can't know everything. So I suggest you stop looking for a theory of everything. And what you wanna do is find the things that bring balance and unify. The good ways of the golden ratio, 369. Find something that fits between both things that bridges. Maybe maybe relativity and quantum physics aren't supposed to be linked. Maybe something is supposed to be between those two that both of those things link to. So anyway, this has gone on 30 minutes. It was longer than I wanted to speak about, but you know, we just need to get on the focus. We need to focus on humanity and ourselves.
Because once we have overcome the limitations of ourselves, we'll start to overcome some of these limitations of physics. Thank you. See you in the next one.